ahead and open your Bibles to the book of Joshua. Be in chapter 1 to begin. I think that as we think about tonight's lesson, a, a uh, lesson about the, the conquering of the city of Jericho, I don't think we can really go into that discussion about what took place there at Jericho, except that we begin with Joshua. Uh, he is really the principal character uh, in that story. You know, Joshua, I think, is an often neglected Bible character, yet he played a very pivotal and a very important role uh, in, in the nation of Israel, especially uh, there as it concludes the, the Exodus. I mean, I think we need to think about the role that he was thrust into. I, I've known preachers that had a very difficult time because they, they followed a preacher that was beloved or maybe had been there many years. Thank you. Well... That's a bad transfer. Um, you know, they that they he had he had been very well liked and and they had a difficult time. I followed a man that had been at a congregation for fifty years, uh, so I could have been born twice in the time that he had been the preacher there. And uh, you know, what wonderful man. And you know, it didn't bother me that everybody said, "Oh, well, we loved him." I, I loved him too. So I was like, "Yeah, I do too." He's my favorite preacher too, <laughs> you know, out of everybody. But you know, you can have a problem with that. But imagine following Moses after 40 years, becoming the leader of uh, a pretty stubborn group of people, and having to follow in the shoes of, of one of the greatest Bible characters that there is. And that's where we see Joshua. And, you know, a lot of times when you look at nations or groups of people in various situations, when you lose a great leader, when a great leader leaves the scene, sometimes that leads to chaos and turmoil, right? And yet Joshua steps into that void uh, of Moses being gone and and does very well in leading the people into uh, the land of Canaan. Let's look at Joshua's history just a little bit to get to know him better. He He kind of is overshadowed in the story of Moses and the Exodus itself, but yet we keep seeing him show up throughout that that, that narrative. Joshua was an Ephraimite. We see that in Numbers chapter 13 and verse 8. He had military experience leading the army of the Israelites against the Amalekites in Exodus chapter 17 and verse 10. I I love that story because Moses tells him, you go and you... You attack those Amalekites and God will be with you and I'll be right up there on the hill, right? And he said, I'll have the staff of God with me. And and Moses held up that staff, right? And when he held up the staff, the battle went the Israelite way. But Moses got tired. And as the staff came down, the battle would begin to go toward the Amalekites. And so they came and Aaron and Hur, a man named Hur, came and they, they put a stone down and let Moses sit down and hold the staff. But his arms still got tired, so they got to where they held his hands up for him until the battle was won. It's a great story. Uh, But Joshua led that attack there against the Amalekites in that chapter. You know, I think when we think about that story as well, it's a great lesson of how brethren help when even the best of us grows tired in the service of the Lord. Sometimes we grow tired. Moses grew tired that day. Uh, But yet there were two brothers there that raised up his hands. You know, he had been Moses' servant or his aide, however you want to put that. He had been that for 40 years. We see this when Moses went up to Mount Sinai that he took Joshua. Nobody else came, but Joshua came at least part of the way there on that journey up Mount Sinai. Because Moses is up there, and of course we know what happens that after the time that Moses had been up there for 40 days that the people made a golden calf, right, and began to worship it, began to celebrate around it. And God says to Moses, your people, he starts calling them your people instead of his people, and God's going to wipe them out. He said, I'll destroy them and I'll keep my promises to Abraham through you. Moses, in a way that is not unique just to that story, I don't think he in any way changes God's mind. I think God gave Moses the chance to be an intercessor for the people, which is 
exactly the foreshadowing of Christ that Moses is. But he intercedes for the people and God doesn't destroy them. Moses comes down the hill. Somewhere in that journey down the hill, he comes across Joshua wherever he left him. And Joshua is there and he goes, I, Sounds like war down in the camp. Now, I want you to think about that for just a moment. Here's the warrior, the general uh, of the Israelite army. He hears what he thinks is war in the camp, but he doesn't leave his post with Moses. He didn't run down there. I'm the general. I've got I to head on down there. No, his place is where Moses left him, and he stayed there. <laughs> Part of me can just see Moses shaking his head. Going, it, ain't, it ain't war. It's singing. And it ain't, you know, it's not, Moses ain't happy that it's singing, right? And while it wasn't sounds of war, it wasn't long before there were sounds of war when Moses and the Levites began to kill those that had done those things, going from position to position in the camp doing that. You know, Joshua was very faithful in this role as, as Moses' aide and as his servant. And in Exodus chapter 33 and verse 11, Joshua would guard and maintain the tent of meeting that Moses used to speak face to face with God. You know, when they were on the move, there was a tent that Moses set out away from the camp. And he would go there in the glory of God, that pillar of cloud would descend on that tent. And God, it says, would speak to Moses there face to face, as you know, in, in a very unique way. But when Moses wasn't at that tent, Joshua never left it. Probably part guard. Probably doing whatever Moses wanted him to do, but uh, he was very dedicated in that role. In Numbers chapter 11 and verse 28, we see him seek to defend Moses' spiritual position with the people. Two men in the camp, uh, Eldad and Medad, were prophesying, and Joshua urged Moses to make them stop. You know, there's a part of Joshua here that goes... You know, I want you to stay on. I want you to stay the one that people look to. But these men weren't doing anything wrong. They were prophesying by God. I love Moses' response, and I think we begin to see why the Bible says he was such a meek man, meekest man of all. Uh, Moses goes, "I wish everybody was a prophet." <laughs> I wish all the people were a prophet. He, you know, he wants everybody to be that kind of person. And it doesn't bother him one bit that these two men are uh, prophesying. In Numbers 14, Joshua along with Caleb were the only spies that advocated attacking Canaan right then. Okay, at that point, we're only about a, maybe, maybe right about a year from the time that they left Egypt. They spent time at Mount Sinai. They've come straight up from Sinai now. And they are at the, at the southern border there of the land of Canaan. It's only been about a year, and they have the opportunity to go in the land right then. They send the 12 spies in, and 10 come back, and they, oh, it's terrible. There's just no way. We're like grasshoppers in their eyes. You know, everything was terrible, except for Joshua and Caleb. With the Lord... We need to go take the land right now. Imagine how much different their lives would have been. Instead of where our story is going to come to tonight, once again at the border of the, of the land of Canaan, but 41 years after leaving Egypt because of their unfaithfulness. You know, the people listened to those other ten, and it says that they wept in their doors, in the doors of their tent that night, and when Joshua and Caleb tried to tell the people that they could take the land, the people were going to stone them. I mean, these guys were standing up to a crowd that was obviously getting violent and ready to stone them. And just about the time they went to try to stone them, the glory of the Lord descended and put an end to it all. He stopped it. And he told them they'd never, they wouldn't get into the land. In fact, no one over the age of 20 that left the land of Egypt would enter into the land of Canaan. Except Joshua and Caleb. That's it. So God then spends 40 years letting them die in the wilderness just right outside the promised land. You know, the faithlessness of the people 
just would not let them listen to Joshua and Caleb, who were men of great faith. Moses commissioned Joshua as the leader before the people. In Deuteronomy chapter 31, verses 7 through 8, he says, Be strong and courageous, for you shall go with this people into the land which the Lord has has sworn to our fathers to give them, and you shall give it to them as an inheritance. The Lord is the one who goes ahead of you. He will be with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Do not be dismayed. That's a man speaking from experience, isn't it? As tough as the job that Moses had was, he looks back on it and he tells the man that's going to take his place, you hang in there because the Lord's with you and he'll never let you down. You know, it had to be, don't you think, a bitter pill for Moses? But I think Moses was quick to own what he did. You know, God said, you did not show me holy before the people. Folks, when we don't obey God, we, we demonstrate that he's, we, we do not show him as holy. And God said, you can't enter the land, Moses. You got to see it before he died. From the top of a mount, Mount Nebo. They didn't get to go in. But he tells the young man that would lead them in to trust the Lord. After Moses had died, God himself commissions Joshua to lead following that death. In Joshua chapter 1 and verses 2 through 9, this is what he says. Moses, my servant, is dead. Remember, Moses died away from the people. Now therefore arise, cross this Jordan, you and all this people to the land which I am giving to them, to the sons of Israel, every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I have given it to you, just as I spoke to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and as far as the great sea toward the setting of the sun will be your territory. No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. And just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you, and I will not fail you or forsake you. There's God saying exactly what Moses said, right? Jesus said something similar to us, didn't he? Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So he says, Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land in which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Do you think God thinks that Joshua needs, is going to need some strength in this? Going to need a little courage in this? That's twice in two, two sentences that God says, You need to be strong and courageous. Listen to me about this. I'm serious. It's not going to be easy. But I'm going to be with you. Isn't that really the difference? He says, Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left so that you may have success wherever you go. And this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be, very, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. And then you will make your way prosperous. And then you will have success. You know, he tells him to make sure that the word, the law of Moses was in his mind. That he was looking at it. That he was meditating upon it every day. You know, there is one point in Joshua's time that he ruled the people, or led the people, that he sat down and read the whole law to them. He read the completed books of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, right? He had those complete now that Moses has gone. And he read them to the people. He wanted the people to have them in their hearts as well. God says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. That's the third time, by the way. Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. The second time he's told him that. Verses 10 and 11. (laughs) I love it. Because Joshua leaves that little conversation with God and he goes straight out to the commanders and he says, everybody start getting ready. We're going across that river in three days. Okay, you've got to move a lot of people. Okay, so it's not like you can just say, okay, let's go. Uh, you know, you've got to get everything together. But 
He says, three days, we're going to cross that river. I mean, there's no delay. Joshua's not got to think about it. He's not got to kind of come up with a strategy. God said, go across that river. I'm going across that river. And so we see a man that immediately acts upon what God had told him to do. You know, Joshua, as a, as a biblical character, is a foreshadowing of Jesus. Joshua is the word Yahashua, which is uh, a... Uh, as the word Yahweh, it could be Hoshea, but yet they add the word, they, they add a part which is part of Yahweh to it. And it means Yahweh is salvation. That's what his name means, Yah- Yahashua. And, and, and when we look at the equ- Greek equivalent of that Hebrew word, it is, the, it is the name Jesus. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21, uh, Joseph is told, She will bear a son. And you shall call his name Jesus. Why? For he will save his people from their sins. Yahweh is often translated Lord, right? Lord is salvation. And Jesus became that very thing. And that's why he was named that. Joshua also replaced Moses as leader. And Jesus would replace Moses as covenant or lawgiver. It is the law of Moses that was in effect that Jesus would replace uh, at the end of with the death of his with the, with his death on the cross and the nailing of it to the cross. Joshua led the people into the physical promised land. Jesus will take us into the spiritual promised land of heaven. So those two are very closely tied together, as well as Moses and Jesus as well. Now I want us to come to and think about the story we're going to look at tonight, and that is the story of Jericho. I want us to think about this for a moment from the standpoint of the city of Jericho. Where that green line is there, you kind of can look off at the distance, the picture Jonah took from, we're actually standing on the ruins of the city of Jericho, and you can kind of see that dark line that runs out there under that green line, and that is the Jordan River. That's the plants that grow along the Jordan River in that desert area. You, anywhere you see green, you've you got water. And so that long line there is not a shadow, but instead that is actually the Jordan River Valley running across there. So that's the view. That's the view that the people of Jericho would have had with the exception of the modern-day buildings. It was the view that they had uh, as they looked toward the river. The river there is only five miles to the east. It is downhill from Jericho. So, you know, all of that would have been very visible for the people there in the city. Now imagine what you imagine that you are the people of Jericho. I got to thinking about that as I was working on this. Is it Jerichoans? Would that be right? Jerichites? I don't know. I wasn't sure exactly what you are if you're a, Jer- a person in Jericho. But the people of Jericho, imagine you're one of them. And you're looking from your wall. What do you see when you look out there? <laughs> yeah, yeah um, that's exactly what you see. You see at least two million people, probably two to three million. Estimates vary. You see two to three million people on the other side of that river valley out there where it's all brown past the, uh, the area of the Jordan River. You see them camped in a military-style rectangle with sections, just like an army would do. But it was the tribes, right? Around the headquarters, the tabernacle. It looks very much like a uh, military-style encampment. And maybe that comes from Moses. Maybe maybe that kind of comes from his, his past. Josephus tells us about Moses, that when he was still in Egypt, before the Exodus began, that he was a general in the Egyptian army, and that he actually led a campaign against the Ethiopians really don't have a reason not to believe it. We don't really have a lot of proof of it, but uh, that's what he wrote. And if Moses was, of course, that would give him a skill set for moving large groups of people from here to there in inhospitable lands because everything away from the Nile River was inhospitable. Uh, You know, perfect skill set, isn't it, for what he had to do with these people? And it stands to reason that the organization of a camp might follow some of the same lines you imagine looking down there and seeing that? you imagine looking 
down from those walls and five miles away, there's two or three million people at night with their campfires and, all, and things lit up down there and what that looked like. And you're just a little city sitting on the hill. You probably take some comfort in that they're on the other side of the Jordan River, right? <laughs> I mean, there's some comfort in that. Uh, you know, it's sort of like the comfort the English had in World War II with the uh, English Channel. So you take some comfort in that and that the river's running high at this time and they, they would have a very hard time crossing the river. I'm certain that you would be on high alert for any perceived threat coming from that direction. You'd be looking close. Guards would be in the towers every night, right? Watching on the walls. I'm also certain that they were afraid. Listen to what Rahab says to the spies that she's speaking to there in her house a little bit later in chapter 2 and verses 9 through 11. She says, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the terror of you has fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away. What that means is they've been demoralized. They have melted away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan and Sihon and Og whom you utterly destroyed. When we heard it, our hearts melted and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. So there's one thing we know for certain from an inhabitant of the city is that they were afraid. Anybody find it kind of amazing, other than me, that they're talking about something that happened for, over 40 years ago? Still? It's been 40 years. I, I would challenge people to tell me what was happening 40 years ago in history uh, around us, even in our own country, and some people would struggle with that. 40 years ago, they, she's going, we heard. Your God dried up the Red Sea. We heard about that. We're still thinking about that, so even though it's been over 40 years. You know, word has gotten out. And the mass, this mass of people, I mean, really, they've been in this vicinity now for 40 years. They've just kind of wandered around out there on the edges of, of the land of Canaan, just kind of going back and forth and dealing with different problems that were going on out there. But, but they, they've known they're there taking on of the Ammonites and the destroying of, of the two cities that she mentioned. Those are all things that they, they know because they, they're that close to them and they've been that close to them for a while. And now here they are camped out straight across the Jordan River from their city. Now let's think about what the Israelites are seeing. Uh, as, we, as we just saw what the Jordan, what the people in Jericho are seeing, the Israelites are seeing when they look up that hill and see Jericho five miles away. Well, they're probably, you know, they probably saw a small city, but a small city with double walls uh, on about seven to ten acres. It's not a big city. It's not a Jerusalem, uh, as we'll see later. Uh, it's a small city on seven to ten acres of land. It had a small ditch around it, and it's pretty standard layout for walled cities. There's a double wall. There was also a large spring at this location. Uh, we see Elisha purify the spring in 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 21, and this is the spring today, and it still, still pours forth water. And really, that's, that's what you're going to find. When you look at ancient cities, they're either going to be on a river or they're going to be at a spring. There, you know... The, the difference, the, the only one that I, I can think of to, to call and say that, okay, this one's different, is the city of Caesarea on the coast of the Med. And yet the Romans built an aqueduct for miles to bring water to that city. That's the only way it could happen. But the city of Jerusalem is where it's at because of the spring of Gihon. The Gihon Spring still feeds water down the Hezekiah Tunnel tunnel and into the pool of Siloam to this very day and it has been doing that since the first time we see it mentioned as Salem back with Melchizedek in the book of Genesis 
That's why you built a city there. There's water, right? Jericho, water out of that spring right there, and it still flows uh, to this very day. You know, the spring gave the water necessary for the city to be called what it was called in Deuteronomy chapter 34 and verse 3, and that is the city of palms. And you can see palm trees even in this picture surrounding the spring today. This is an aerial view of the ruins of the city of Jericho. It shows, uh, you know, these, these tend to be mounds. They call them tails. You can kind of see how it's built up because in those days, they, and going through the centuries in these cities that stayed in the same place, when they got torn down, they just built right on top of the debris. They, they wouldn't like dig back down. They'd just build on wherever the debris was, and then that city would get torn down, and they'd build on that and build on that. When you stand at the Western Wall in Jerusalem, you're at least 75 feet above the streets of the first century Jerusalem. That's how many times Jerusalem's been rebuilt on itself. That you have to go 75 feet down. You can. You can go down. We went down in those caves, and you go all the way down to the base of that wall, and at one point you're coming down the cave, and you're, you, there's an arch there, and it's one of the original arches from the, the way you went into the temple. But that arch was 75 feet from the ground, and you're right underneath it. And so these cities build upon themselves. And so that's what we see here. We see a tail and a mound built on those debris. And depending on what level you dig, you find different ruins. The city of Gaboa, where Saul was hung on the wall, there's four different nationalities that built cities, and the tail is very tall because they just kept building in different... And depending on where you dig in there, you'll find different nationalities, different pottery, different architecture, everything. Well... If we put the model of Jericho onto that, then we kind of get an idea of what the Israelites looked up at. You know, what they what the Israelites saw was not, as we sometimes talk about in our Bible classes, they did not see an impregnable city. It wasn't impregnable. Um, but certainly, it was a city that if they had conquered it in conventional ways, would have paid a, they, they'd have paid a heavy price in, man, in men and blood uh, to conquer it. But there was no way Jericho ever had a chance to stand against the people of Israel. There's just no way. Um, but that's God's point. He didn't want them to accomplish it. God wanted to accomplish it for them. And that, that's really the point is, as, he begin, as they begin this campaign to take the land of Canaan, which he says, I'm going to drive them out, he wants the very first thing they see is him making it happen, right? Because see, in battle, God can, you know, like the raising of the staff and doing that, that's obviously God, right? But on down on the battlefield with the man that's fighting, he doesn't see the staff necessarily going up and down. He may think he's really doing a good job, and it's all about his skill on the battlefield. But Jericho leaves nothing to be guessed about, does it? God did it. And he's setting the stage for that. So we don't ever need to think that this was so impregnable that they couldn't do it, but it was simply the first place that God could demonstrate what he has already promised that he's going to do throughout the land of Canaan if they would only trust in him. Well, next thing we see is the spies. And like any good battlefield commander, Joshua sends out a recon team, right, to see what lies beyond or ahead of him as he prepares to move his army in Joshua chapter 2. He tells these spies, I want you to especially get a good look at Jericho. Now, he has not yet been told by God the plan. Right now, Joshua is thinking like a general. He is thinking, I need to see the layout. I need to understand what's going on up there so I can figure out how to lead my troops against it, right? That's how he's thinking right now. Now, that's going to change. But that's where he's at at this moment. The spies entered the city and are staying in the house, at the house of Rahab the harlot. And, and, you know, there was little differentiation before we go, well, why, was it, why were they at the house of a harlot? <laughs> you know, I think people go, well, those spies are not very good guys. Um, we need to understand... That in Bible times, an inn really was a place for harlots. And differentiating the two didn't really work. 
because that's just where that, that, those kind of things took place. Uh, when you look at the Hebrew word translated harlot, it is interesting. It's not a word, you know, what we have translated, and most Bibles, most translations I'm aware of have harlot there. It's not a word for prostitute. It's not a word for harlot. It's a word for woman, various things, but none of them have any connotation or any kind of a, uh, it doesn't allude in any way to a harlot. But now, that being the case, we know she is, or she was at least at some point. Because the New Testament clarifies it for us in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 31 and James chapter 2 and verse 25 where they call her Rahab a harlot and they use a Greek word there that there is no ambiguity to. It's prostitute. It's harlot. So as we see that given to us in inspiration, then it clarifies any kind of an argument. And I've heard the argument. I've heard arguments made that, you know, that's not what the Hebrew word is. And that's true. But God's still writing the Bible in Hebrews. He's still writing the Bible in James when he clarifies the fact that, yes, he was. It's very much like what we see in Isaiah chapter 7, that the word there doesn't necessarily can mean young woman. But Matthew leaves us with no doubt that it was a virgin. And so, you know, you take and you know that God sometimes will come back later and say this is, you know, he'll clarify these things that for reasons of his own he left ambiguous maybe in the past due to prophecy. Whatever she may have been in the past, this woman would be mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11. How many would like to be in Hebrews chapter 11? <laughs> to have your name there by faith. You're in, put your name there. I don't care if it's the last verse. I'd be glad to be on the last verse if I was the last one mentioned. Uh, you know, so here, here she is. She's, she's mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11. There's actually... Uh, you know, some detail to her where other ones like Gideon and David, <laughs> they're just mentioned. They're not even, nothing is even said about what they did. And so there's something here that I think we stop and we think about a little bit. Her faith lay in the fact that she believed that God would cause the Israelites to prevail no matter what. Remember what she told the spies? Your God. Your God did that. Your God did this. And your God is the God of heaven and, and the earth. The woman believed. <laughs> she, she hasn't actually seen the things that the Israelites saw, right? Well, it's so much like Jesus' ministry. <laughs> she hasn't even actually seen them, these things happen. She's heard about them happening, and she has grown faith from it. Very much the same way you and I grow faith, in that we didn't see the miracles, but we read about them, right? And she has faith. And she's, you know, and that's why she looks to them and she says God's going to win and she was right. Consider how James speaks about her. James chapter 2 and verse 25, he uses her as an example of a person who combined her faith with works. From that, a tr she had a trust in what she believed. She trusted it. And this demonstrated the, the realness of what she believed. It was more than just words. I want you to take note of the other person James uses, James uses as an example in James chapter 2 about faith and works. Just a little-known Bible character named Abraham was the one he mentioned just before he mentioned Rahab. How does she land in the company of Abraham? It's amazing what faith can do to change a person, isn't it? She took in the spies and she sent them out another way. Those were her works according to James. That's what he says. Her actions based in her belief in what God could and would do saved the spies and their actions in turn saved her and her family. As we've already alluded to, Rahab saved the spies when the king of Jericho got word that they were in the city to, to gather information. And he sent men to capture the spies and, and bring them uh, to the king. Where did Rahab hide the spies? Huh? Where in her house? On the roof? How? Under the flax, yes. <laughs> she hid them under the flax on her roof. Flax was used for its fibers. Still is, actually. One could produce rope or linen cloth, clothing. 
Uh, it is believed to be the oldest known textile fiber in history. There were probably, they were probably on her roof being soaked and processed to be separated so that the fibers could be used in spinning. Um, I'm not an expert in flax or spinning or separating fibers. <laughs> That's the way I understand it. And so she puts those men underneath those bundles of, of flax. Rahab told them that the men had come and she did not know where they were from. I didn't know they were Israelites. You know, and uh, that they had left before sundown when the gates of the city were closed. Now, now we begin to see that, that that's even another little clue, right? That they're a little anxious about what's going on across the river. Well, when Sunday goes down, those gates are shutting. Now, that, that was common in most, but large cities wouldn't necessarily do that. Um, but uh, they, they certainly were closing the gates at this time, and we'll see that they, they seem to be very fervent about that later. She tells them, boy, I tell you what, if you pursue them right now, you can catch them. <laughs> you know, she's almost talking like they just left. <laughs> you know, I mean, they just headed out the door. You get out there and you go and you can, you'll, you'll find them. Well, the soldiers left the city and it states that as soon as they went through the gate, they shut them. I mean, they, you know, I, I think they're spooked now. If you've got a spy in your town, you don't know. The army could be right out there over the hill and you just don't know it. Uh, if the men were still in the city too, then they were probably thinking, we want to make sure they don't get out. Logically, the men assumed that the spies were running back to the camp of the Israelites. And so it makes sense, doesn't it, that they went east, that they went down the hill toward the Jordan River. I mean, if, I mean, if you were in the city of Jericho and you headed out and you were trying to get away from people that were probably pursuing you, you can literally see the lights of your camp. Wouldn't that kind of be the direction you'd think to go? Well, that's what the soldiers are thinking, and that's exactly the direction they go. They go all the way to the crossings uh, on the Jordan River. Well, after telling the spies that uh, what what we read a few moments ago in regard to what God could do, Rahab asked them to spare the lives of herself, her father, her mother, her brothers, her sisters, and all who belong to them. She said, I've done this for you, and I've saved you. I ask you to, to save us. She you know, I think that shows her faith, too, that she knows they're coming and she knows they're going to win. And the spies agree to that. She tells them to go to the mountain. Depending on your translation, it could be the hills. But if you're standing, and I couldn't find a picture that, was, that would do its service, but if you're standing looking back to the west from Jericho, it's just all uphill. It's straight up. And, and what you see here is that Jericho is... Hell, the bush may be in the way for some, but it's down there at the very bottom at 720 feet below sea level. Remember, it's in the, the Jordan Valley as it heads down to the Dead Sea, the lowest point on earth. Uh, 720 feet below sea level, and the city of Jerusalem is somewhere around 2,500 feet above sea level. And you make that climb in about 15 miles. And so it's pretty straight up. And it's a mountain. It leads you right up into the hill country of Judah. And so that's where she tells them to go, to go up into the hill country. She sends them that way, which is in the opposite direction of the Israelite camp. And the Bible then tells us that the pursuers were there in between those, in between the camp and the city looking for them. She lowers the spies out of an opening in the wall where her house was. And they tell her to tie a cord of scarlet thread in the window that the people in all her in the house will be saved. And I like this warning. <laughs> when we come, stay in the house. And if anybody decides they want to go outside, well, their blood's on their hands. Because if you walk out of that door, we're not responsible for your salvation anymore. There's a that'll preach a little bit, won't it? About leaving the church? You can go out there, you're on your own. Better stay in where the Lord will save you. And so, you know, he warns her about that. Don't leave the house. So the, the spies, they stayed in the hill country for three days and then returned uh, to Joshua. And listen to what they told him in verse 24, chapter 2. Surely the Lord has given all the land into our hands. Moreover, all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before us. Now this is... This is what Rahab told them. I don't know what they may have seen to um, 
solidify that in their own minds, but uh, they certainly believe that that is the case. And I guarantee you that any, any commander of an army would love to have a demoralized enemy to his front. And so this news that they are all demoralized is good news for Joshua as he continues to think about how he's going to uh, take this city. Then we come to the crossing of the Jordan. When it was time to cross the Jordan River, the river was overflowing as it did yearly. And the priests took the Ark of the Covenant and they went down to the water's edge and when their feet stepped into the water, now I, I want us to think for just a moment. I, from a biblical, what the Bible explains here and tells us here is not always the pictures we saw as children. I remember seeing the Jordan River. It had this little opening, maybe about as wide as these pews, and people were going through it. And the Ark of the Covenant's there in the middle, and, and they're going right through there, right? It's not what the Bible says happened. The Bible didn't even pull up where they were at, or the, the water didn't even pull up where they were at. See that city up there, Adam? At Adam, the Bible tells us that the water there at Adam stood up like a wall. It stopped. Like we think of in the Red Sea, right, when, when they walked between the walls of water. That happened at Adam, not down here, because the Israelites are crossing directly across from the city of Jericho. That's 15 miles to the north. And basically God just stopped the water at Adam that was coming down from the springs of the Jordan River that are north of the Sea of Galilee. And the rest of the river just ran down into the Dead Sea. We're not talking about a gap this big. We're talking about 30 miles of dry ground from Adam and it says all the way down to the Salt Sea. The Jordan River disappeared south of Adam. I mean, it wasn't a small thing. And there's probably some application there for us. There's probably something for us to, to think about with that, right? God throws the door wide open. The Jordan River has always been an impediment for those coming from the east, and, and yet God throws a 30-mile door open and basically says the land, there's nothing that's going to get in my way. And I'm not just going to part it this much. <laughs> I'm going to remove the obstacle, almost, uh, almost half of the obstacle that they would count on. And 30 miles of the river gone, that's a lot of people can cross there in a very quick time. But that's what happens, and that's what the scriptures tell us happened. You know, the priest stood there in the middle. I, I like their faith, too. They, they don't believe the water's going to suddenly come rushing back down the river. And I think God wanted them to show the people that they could cross with, without any kind of... Because remember, the people that walked, most of the people, now there were some children below the age of 20, right? Joshua and Caleb. But all those people that walked through the Red Sea, they're dead. And here they are. And I, some of them might have been going, I don't know. That water could come back. I've, you know, I could come flowing back down. So the priests, what do they do? They stand right in the center of the river, the riverbed, and hold the ark until everybody is across. They hold it right there in the center. And as long as they're there, everybody's walking across on dry ground. Yes, sir. You know, I, I don't, I don't know if they saw the water back up because they're so they're five miles out. But I guarantee you one thing they did see. Well, they saw two million people crossing and coming straight at them. They didn't miss that one. Uh, you know, I figure they stirred up some dust, um, especially walking on that dry <laughs> riverbed. Uh, but they saw two million people coming across to their little city. Now they were afraid when they were on the other side of the river, what do you think is going on in their minds now that they can see the whole mass of them coming across uh, the river at them? 
Do what? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Knees start knocking. In fact, the Bible tells us that, all, that this event right here spread across the entire area of Canaan all the way to the Mediterranean Sea. This news spread like wildfire, and everybody became demoralized at the thought of what was about to happen to them. The Israelites camp at Gilgal. You can see where that arrow ends. That's Gilgal. That's only, that, well, that's not even full two miles from Jericho. So they've gone from five miles on the other side of a river to two miles right outside the door. And they're camped out there right next to them. Verse Chapter 6 and verse 1, we understand why it says, Now Jericho was tightly shut <laughs> because, the, because of the sons of Israel. No one went in and no one came out. The doors are shut and they're not opening. They don't trust anybody anymore. So the Israelites observed the Passover. You know, I, I guess I missed this for a long time, and I, I love it when I find things that I've missed in, in Bible study over the years. I, that's one of my favorite things is to find things that I, I think I should have seen before, but I suddenly have found them. They observed the Passover and eat the produce of the lamb for the first time, and the Bible tells us that the next day, what stopped? The manna. Remember, all you had to do was walk out and gather it off the ground around your tent every day. But that stopped. And there's some reasons for that too, right? They're where they're supposed to be. They're now committed. Sort of like uh, the Spanish explorer burning his ships, right? <laughs> You're now committed to conquer the land and plant their own crops and provide for themselves. God had brought them to a fertile land that... As he told them repeatedly, flowed with milk and honey. Now it's your job to get it done. I've got you here. I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to drive them out. And then you'll... Remember he even told them, he said, you're going to eat of crops you didn't plant, trees you didn't plant, and you're going to live in houses you didn't build. Now you've got to go do that. But like any good commander, Joshua went out and he was surveying. I'm running out of time. We're not even going to get to Jericho. That's bad, isn't it? Um... Like any good commander, Joshua is surveying his future battlefield, and he comes upon the, uh, a man standing with a sword, and he says, Are you with us? Are you with them? Are you with us? You know, who are you with? He says, I am the captain of the Lord's host. You know, he's told then, You take off your shoes, for you're standing on holy ground. Just like Moses, some 40 plus years earlier, standing on holy ground, and he removed them. And then he gives them instructions. Joshua is to march the men of war around the city once for six consecutive days. Numbers chapter 26 and verse 31. Now, it's not everybody. It's not all the Israelites marching around the city. It's the men of war. So what's that number? Well, according to the second census in Numbers chapter 26 and verse 51, that is 601,730 men. That's a lot of people. And when you think about walking around a city of... 10 to 17 acres, <laughs> they're going to ring that thing. and I mean, there's never going to be a point where, you know, the tail end is, is here. In the, I mean, it's just going to be a constant flow of people around there for a while. You know, you watch some of these, uh, the military parades like after World War II where thousands and thousands of troops were going down the boulevards and, and it would take a long time. And I don't think they ever marched 600,000 men down those boulevards. And that's exactly what's going on every day. Don't you know that people in Jericho were just freaking out every day when they saw them coming and surrounding their city, literally surrounding it? Kind of reminds me that the dread of death is sometimes worse than death itself. There was a kid at, church, at camp one year, and I'd known this kid all my life, and all his life really because I was older than he was. But he, pulled, he, he, he did something a little mischievous to, to me and another uh, counselor. And so we just told people to tell him we were going to get him. We never really did anything to him. But we kind of walked behind him and looked at him. <laughs> you know? he, he finally came up to us on about Wednesday and said, just do it. Whatever you're going to do, just do it. <laughs> you know? I was like, we ain't doing nothing to you. <laughs> what do you mean? So sometimes that dread is worse. Maybe that was the way it was for the people of Jericho just wanting to get it over with. But on the seventh day, they walked around the city seven times and the and, and the angel had told them that the priests would blow their trumpets and the people were to shout and the wall would fall down. They were to go straight from where they're standing, straight into the city. That kind of gives the idea that they're surrounding it as well. 
Everybody's going to come from all the directions when the walls fail. I do want us to take note of one thing. We know what happens. We know the city does. That's exactly what happens, right? But I want us to note Joshua's respect for God's authority. Because, folks, this is, this is a pertinent lesson for today. God didn't say they couldn't talk. But God said, there is a time when I want them to. And Joshua said, y'all don't say a word until that moment. Somebody could say, well, God didn't say we couldn't talk. No, but he told you when to. He said, don't even let a word come out of your mouth when you're walking around that city. Until the day when I say shout. And then you shout. There was respect for the authority of God's word. Folks, when the Bible tells us something, tells us what to do, we need to respect that. And not try to assume or try to presume what we think God means, but just do what God says. So Joshua does that. You know, they were told that everything in the city, I'm going to cover this before we finish up, I'm late. They were told that everything in the city was like God's, right? To the one who wins the victory, it is his spoils. They didn't win the victory. They didn't win the battle. God won the battle. And, and what was there was his. And that's going to be Achan's downfall, right? When he takes nearly a half a million dollars in modern money worth of gold and silver and obviously a pretty shirt. <laughs> Achan was all about his clothes, I guess. Um, but they, you know, he took a garment, a mantle. But it was God's. There's application for us in that today too. The victory that we have in being a part of the Lord's church is all God. None of it belongs to us. We don't take it. It doesn't belong to us. We don't deserve it. It's God's. You know, and I, I don't... You know, we should never be in a position where we think that we should be in this position or that position in the Lord's church because ultimately we don't even deserve to be in the Lord's church. He won the victory, not us. But yet, He allows us to be a part of that great victory just like He did uh, the Israelites. Well... We know Achan's sin, and we know what he did, and we understand that God means what he says. And I wish we had time to go more into that, but we don't. I appreciate your good attention and good comments tonight. Sorry I went a little bit over. The ice cream will still be there, so don't, don't miss out on that. But let's end with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for this time that we've had to be together, to study from your holy and divine word, to look at uh, great men of faith, men that had great faith in you, Father, and what you can do for us. And we pray that you help us to have that kind of faith in our lives as well, that we may always be strong, we may always be courageous when it comes to serving you. Father, we pray that you go with us now and that you bless us as you always have. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.